will take up the first discuss the uh, heart failure we are going to have two sessions in the first sessions we are going to discuss the etiopathogenesis on the mechanism of heart failure and second part we are going to uh, discuss the management part dr ramesh adura is uh, with us uh, here to discuss uh, the heart failure and dr ramesh adura is very senior uh, professor she was uh, hod uh, from gv panth hospital new delhi and she is a program in charge in this hospital uh, in this program from metro hospital noida also uh, so i would like to request dr ramesh arora please uh, start the topic uh, with uh, heart failure dr ramesh arora please discussing about uh, heart failure today you all know that cardiovascular diseases are increasing all over the world and so in india apart from coronary artery disease and rheumatic heart disease which is common in our country heart failure is a major public health problem at the moment about 15 million people in india are suffering from heart failure and 1.5 million people are being added to this burden every year in our country because of rheumatic heart disease the burden is further added in the young by rheumatic heart disease and that is about 1 million people being a disease of the elderly this uh, disease accounts for about 6 to 10% above the age of 65 years now discussing in detail about uh, the topic what is ex- the definition of heart failure heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome which is that impairs the ability of the ventricle to pump blood at an adequate rate to meet the requirements of the metabolic tissues or can do so only from an elevated filling pressures which only means either there is impaired contractility or the filling is reduced or the second definition which we can have is a complex clinical syndrome which is characterized by abnormal left ventricular function and neuro hormonal regulation leading to effort intolerance fluid retention and reduced longevity this word of neuro regulation or adrenergic regulation is known to all of us that whenever there is heart failure at that time either there is uh, frank starling mechanism that is the myocardial cells they dilate that is the increase in size and increase the stroke volume but there is a certain limit to that and if it is beyond 2.2 microns at that time they cannot increase the contractility more and the heart fails the second mechanism is mainly the sympathetic that is it increases the heart rate increases the blood pressure and the contractility that also is up to a certain limit beyond which the heart starts failing and this adrenergic mechanism can be release of norepinephrine causing increase in contractility and this can also cause myocardial hypertrophy and ventricular remodeling lastly sympathetic drive also leads to renin angiotensin system and this regulation really leads to release of renin further release of angiotensin 2 and then release of aldosterone all these are vasoconstrictors and cause fluid retention and congestive heart failure going on to the types of heart failure 
हार्ट फेलियर कैन बी एक्यूट और क्रॉनिक इट ओनली मीन्स द रेट एट विच द सिंड्रोम डेवलप्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल एक्यूट एम आई लीड्स टू एक्यूट हार्ट फेलियर ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द पेशेंट यू नो प्रेजेंट इन एक्यूट एम आई विद हार्ट फेलियर और मेनी ए टाइम्स पेशेंट्स ऑफ एक्यूट एम आई कैन प्रेजेंट विद ए पेपलरी मसल रपचर दे प्रेजेंट विद माइट्रेटिक एजिटेशन एट एन एक्यूट एलवियम और यू हैव ऑल्सो सीन पेशेंट्स प्रेजेंटिंग विद वेंटिकुलर रिसेप्टर रपचर दे ऑल्सो आर इन्फेरियर दैट इज वट इज कॉल्ड एन एक्यूट रपचर एंड एक्यूट हार्ट फेलियर विद डेवलप सडनली Even patients of infective endocarditis, when they develop rupture of the valve, they present in acute heart failure. While chronic is the one, supposing we have patients of rheumatic heart disease, mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation of varying degrees of severity, they go on to heart failure at a particular time, and that is called a chronic heart failure. Then, what is a forward or a backward failure? Forward means inability. to have the adequate cardiac output and backward means dumping of blood back into the ventricles the good examples of forward failure are myocardial damage which can be because of the ischemia or it can be because of myocarditis uh, that is a known ischemic infection and backward failure is because of uh, regurgitation of blood for example in aortic regurgitation then failure can be left sided it can be right sided it means the chamber it affects first left sided failure the examples are mainly myocardial damage myocardial infarction myocarditis hypertension coagulation aortic stenosis aortic regurgitation most of the time it is the left heart failure which leads to right heart failure but there are examples where the right heart failure alone develops for example acute pulmonary embolism there are patients in down in south in kerala where endomyocardial fibrosis develops only in the right side of the heart sometimes idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy is only affecting the right side of the heart then there are low output or a high output um, failures by low output we mean that the amount of uh, cardiac output or the stroke volume is less and that happens with myocardial damage whereas high output failure are the ones for example where the pulse cardiac output is more the pulse pressure is wide the extremities are warm there are cases of thyrotoxicosis anemia very very av fistulas lastly systolic or diastolic failure as the word itself suggests that systolic is caused by abnormality of the systolic function and impairment to expel blood from the ventricle and diastolic function with is due to impairment in the ventricular failure there are two more terms one is the myocardial failure which is because of the systolic or diastolic function of the heart and another one is a circulatory failure which is because of the hemorrhagic um, shock it is a non cardiac condition and the function of the heart is mainly normal in that now there are various ways to classify heart failure and the acc and aha has given this classification because there are innumerable causes of heart failure and the management differs for each case so in order to compile them and order to know about the prognosis of these patients they have been grouped together into stage a b c and d now what is stage a stage a is the one where patients are at high risk but they do not have any signs or symptoms at the moment they have no identifiable structural or functional abnormality of the myocardium pericardium or the valves and the patients at risk are who they are patients of coronary artery disease hypertension diabetes alcoholic abuse or those who have a family history of cardiomyopathy then stage b is the one where there is a structural heart disease but at the moment there are no symptoms or signs of heart failure for example previous myocardial infarction ventricular hypertrophy or dilatation and asymptomatic valvular heart disease of which mitral stenosis is one of the most important example stage c in which there is a underlying heart disease and patients have current or prior symptoms 
symptoms can be any dyspnea or fatigue or will be discussing about that then stage d is the advanced structural heart disease with marked symptoms of heart failure even at rest despite medical therapy they are symptomatic and many a times they are hospitalized again and again these are the patients who need specialized interventions which will be discussing in detail now what are the clinical features which we can get exertional dyspnea paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea orthopnea cough hemoptysis they are all because of the pulmonary congestion and fatigue and weakness they are because of the low cardiac output the most important example of easy fatigability and weakness is mitral regurgitation cerebral symptoms anxiety headache confusion loss of memory insomnia many a times these symptoms because of the low cardiac output are labeled under that patient is psychiatric the patient doesn't um, is uh, just pretending that's all is being talked about these patients but they are specific symptoms of low cardiac output and cerebral anoxia then urinary symptoms in the nocturia oliguria right sided heart failure because of the back pressure and congestive hepatomegaly produces epigastric discomfort or fullness anorexia nausea vomiting they are all attributed at times to gastrointestinal symptoms and saying that patient just has gaseous abdomen then dependent edema or even go on to ascites chain stroke respiration although this is a sign which is described by the physicians but many a times patients of obesity with obstructive sleep apnea they can have uh, hyperventilation with periods of apnea and mostly described by, by the attendants and the husband or wife of the patient then looking at the signs all signs will depend upon the underlying disease the most common which are to most of the patients with a low cardiac output they have a small volume pulse pulses alternance and tachycardia because of the low cardiac output if it is a high output failure then the pulse is going to be a high volume pulse with warm extremities then raised jvp hepatojugular reflex peripheral edema which is in cardiac conditions mainly, mainly symmetrical and pity congestive cardiomegaly ascites pulmonary congestion pleural effusion mostly bilateral can be even on the right side alone these patients have cardiomegaly gallop sounds and the murmurs the murmurs will depend upon the underlying valvular disease or at times without structural valvular abnormality because of the lv enlargement and geometry disturbance there can be a murmur of mitral regurgitation then some of these patients they are very cachexic and they can have low grade fever even without having any infection now looking at the x ray chest and the ecg the ecg abnormalities will be mainly because of the underlying disease or in the late stages most of them they have intraventricular conduction defects especially in the form of left bundle branch block and the x ray apart from showing mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation picture like things they mainly have cardiomegaly with pulmonary venous congestion with or without pulmonary effusion pleural effusion now looking at the signs and symptoms how do we say that the patient has heart failure these major and minor criteria you all know but first given for rheumatic heart disease and these uh, criteria have been now given by they are called framingham criteria and they are major and minor for diagnosis of heart failure as well major criteria are paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea distended neck waves that is raised jvp pulmonary rals that is adventitious sounds radiographic cardiomegaly acute pulmonary edema and jvp more than 16 cm of water third heart sound or the gallop hepatojugular reflex and the weight loss any weight loss which is more than 4.5 kg in 5 days in response to treatment of heart failure then minor criteria are bilateral ankle edema nocturnal cough dyspnea on ordinary exertion hepatomegaly 
pleural effusion and decrease in vital capacity by one third. A patient may have tachycardia more than 120 beats per minute. If there are two major or one major and two minor criteria, then diagnosis probability or possibility of heart failure is diagnosed. If we look at the minor criteria, then we should be very sure that they are not because of any other medical condition. As far as investigations are concerned, when a patient comes, we always send the blood samples and the blood samples are being given to find out the hemoglobin, the total counts to find out if there is any septicemia. We try to find out their erythromide site sediment, uh, sedimentation rate and the others are the left liver function test, the kidney function test, the electrolyte balance. All these are regular tests which are being done and they are not related to any type of heart failure. Same is with the ECG and the X-ray. Now, the markers which are there for heart failure and which can be done and the relevance of that is that they are related to the clinical outcome as well as to the survival. There is inverse relationship between these levels because as I told you that there is a mechanism which is called adrenergic drive, there is a mechanism which is called oxidized stress and there is a mechanism like release of uh, renin and uh, aldosterone. All these they lead to the various levels in the blood and I tell you that there is an inverse relationship between the survival and the plasma level of norepinephrine, renin activity, angiotensin vasopressin, atrial and brain natriuretic peptides which are increased in heart failure, endothelin 1 and the inflammatory markers are tumor necrosis factor, interleukins which can be 1, 6 or 10. Then there is oxidized stress and this leads to increase in serum uric acid and low levels of low density lipoproteins. Then, when a patient of myocardial infarction comes, we all do cardiac troponin, but they can be raised even in non ischemic uh, tissues. They are just telling us the damage of the myocytes, whether it's I or T. And then lastly, the level of hematocrit. Recently, there has been a lot of concern about hematocrit or anemia in cases of heart failure and a lot of studies are garnered around it. Anemia is the result or it is the cause of heart failure, we really do not know. What we know is that these patients have anemia. The mechanisms, they are postulated and they are said to be decreased sensitivity to erythropoietin receptors or there are hemopoietic inhibitors in the blood or the level of iron is reduced. So what we can do is that we can increase the iron level as well as in the therapy as well as we can give erythropoietin factor in the form of Darby poietin alpha which is available. There is a study going on which is called red HF which means giving these erythropoietins that mainly the Darby poietin is being given to find out whether these patients improve or not. Now, coming on to the details of treatment. Now, this is stage 1. Now, what is the treatment when the patient doesn't have any symptoms, patient doesn't have any detectable myocardial, pericardial or a valve involvement seen on the echocardiography? So, what are you going to do for them? The idea is that these are patients who are at high risk of LV dysfunction and we have to detect them early and for early detection we need to do echocardiography and echocardiography at present is the main investigatory treat line which depicts these ventricular dysfunctions. Then secondly, control of risk factors. Although they do not have any signs or symptoms or LV dysfunction, but we know that risk factors like hypertension, systolic as well as diastolic, they contribute to heart failure. So the drugs which are preferred are may not be described in detail for you here. Diuretics, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers and many others are available. The idea is to maintain 
treat hypertension and maintain the levels to normal level. Then treat diabetes. Apart from anti-diabetic treatment, ACE inhibitors are added to diabetic patients. What is the idea? Uh, what is the idea behind it is that mainly the remipril has been shown to reduce in on long term the cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction and heart failure. Similarly, other atherosclerotic uh, risk factors like dyslipidemia, they are treated and those cases who have MI or the risk, they are being given ACE inhibitors to prevent the risk of cardiovascular death, MI and heart failure. Now, other risk conditions like smoking, these are just to change the lifestyle and to tell them not to um, do smoking. This is most important risk factor for myocardial infarction. Then alcohol, cocaine, ionizing radiation, all these anthracyclines and prolonged tachycardia, they can cause myocardial failure in the long run. Now, then comes the stage B. Here, it is LV dysfunction, but patients are asymptomatic. So what have you got to do? You have to recognize heart failure early. So there are some patients like mitral regurgitation which are mild to moderate and they do complain that they have easy fatigability and weakness. Such symptoms should not be ignored. Although they are not particular features of uh, cardiac failure at the moment, but they are low output uh, failure symptoms. Then prevent cardiovascular events. For example, if a patient presents with acute MI, earlier we were trying to prevent MI, now we are trying to see that if a patient has come with acute MI, you have to save the myocardium. So early thrombolytic therapy or use of primary angioplasty as it is being done in most of the centers, this is to be done to preserve the myocardium. Apart from this, after having done this, do add beta blockers ACE inhibitors or the, both of them and also try to treat hypertension and dyslipidemia vigorously in these cases. Then there are cases who have chronic left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Long term treatment with ACE inhibitors has shown to decrease the death and the heart failure in these cases. Many patients are unrecognized and they have atrial flutter or fibrillation. We have seen so many patients of atrial flutter presenting with tachyarrhythmias. They have a 3 is to 1 or 4 is to 1 block and their, when you count the rate on clinical examination, it comes to 72. Patient has cardiomegaly, patient has heart failure. One doesn't know what exactly is the cause. After having excluded the various welder and <coughs> structural causes, then the one comes to the diagnosis that the patient has cardiomegaly because of these arrhythmias and they need to be treated and uh, we have seen that after RF ablation of these flutters, fibrillation, these patients, their ejection fraction returns back to normal. Then asymptomatic valvular heart disease. Most example I was telling you is mitral stenosis. Many patients are diagnosed during pregnancy or on routine examination and they really have severe AS or MS or many of them have regurgitation. So they should be considered for valvoplasty, although not a topic today, but uh, just to show you that how a pregnant woman had come and uh, she was uh, having severe mitral stenosis. And this was diagnosed on routine examination. This shows the LA and LV gradient, that is the LA trace and the marked end diastolic gradient. And the patient can be easily subjected to percutaneous dilatation. Now comes the stage. C. These are the patients who have either prior symptoms or they have current symptoms along with LV dysfunction. The most important drug to be added now is diuretics. The important diuretics which are being added are the loop diuretics. Mainly the furosemide is used and it can be given once a day or twice a day. Then ACE inhibitors. What do we do with them? prescribed to all patients and they are not given for angioedema or renal failure in pregnancy and those with impaired renal functions, bilateral renal stenosis or hyperkalemia. Then the next group of drug is beta block. They are also given to all these patients and 
the very idea that many people have that first the patient is in dysfunction and a heart failure, beta blockers are not to be given. We will be discussing in detail what is the real effect of beta blockers in heart failure and how they should be given. The, then next comes digitalis. Earlier we used, we never had AC inhibitors and beta blockers. When we were residents, we only had digitalis. But now the role of digitalis is limited. It is not a primary drug to be used. It is to be used along with optimal therapy of diuretics, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. And this has been specifically used in cases with arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. Then other drugs which are to be considered are aldosterone antagonists and angiotensin receptor blockers. Apart from that, one has to see that the diet, the other lifestyle patterns are also considered and for dyslipidemia statins. Now, taking into detail about beta blockers, what do beta blockers do? And out of the beta blockers and the ACE inhibitors, most of the main effect is to reduce the progression of congestive heart failure and to prevent the morbidity and mortality or to reduce the mortality. Now, which one should be used first? Beta blocker or ACE inhibitors? This comes to the mind most of the time and the first drug which is preferred is the beta blocker because apart from the other pathways, the beta blocker has anti-arrhythmic effect and this anti-arrhythmic effect also lowers the sudden death and the reduction in the sudden death is 40 to 50 percent which is not there with the ACE inhibitors. That's why this, these beta blockers are preferred as the first choice as compared to the ACE inhibitors. Now, they are recommended where? They are recommended for stable patients. They are recommended in mild, moderate or severe, that is class 2 to 4 symptoms, ischemic or non-ischemic. Then patients with LV systolic dysfunction with or without symptoms following acute MI, long-term beta blockers have been shown to reduce mortality. And you can see that the various trials are there and these trials, they have shown that bisoprolol and metoprolol, which are beta-1 antagonists mainly, and carvedilol, which is alpha, beta-1 and beta-2 antagonists, they have, these three are the only ones who have been shown to reduce mortality, that is the total mortality, all the primary endpoints of the cardiovascular events and also progression of congestive heart failure. The various trials done are with bisoprolol, it is a CBS2 trial which has been done with ejection fraction less than 35 percent and the all patients were in NIH class 3 and 4. In this bisoprolol and enalapril they were given first bisoprolol and then enalapril and in the second group enalapril and bisoprolol and it was seen that the mortality was less in the patients who were first given beta blocker. Same thing is with the metoprolol. Many articles you all have been reading and coming in the journals and they are with beta blocker, mainly metoprolol with ejection fraction less than 40. Those who have a real low ejection fraction they are given carvedilol because they have alpha and beta 1 both antagonistic activity. Now, apart from giving to class 2 and class 3 and 4 patients, there is a revert trial in which NYHT class 1 patients, they have been given metoprolol and long term, long acting metoprolol and this has been shown to reverse remodeling. The idea of showing reverse remodeling is to prevent progression of congestive heart failure. Now, looking at the ACE inhibitors, a large number of ACE inhibitors are available, right? We started from captopril and we are up to zofnatril and number of trials are there which are uh, there with each one of them and what they have shown is that there is uh, when given to patients with ejection fraction less than 40 percent, there is reduction in the mortality by 15 percent and total morbidity and mortality is reduced by 15 to 30 percent. So all these trials are there where with captopril, with enalapril and ARI trial is after acute MI. It has been given to post MI patients and it has been seen that the total mortality at one year is reduced.
Similarly, zofenopril also has been given after MI and total mortality and progression of congestive heart failure as I've shown here for you is reduced. Now, those people who cannot tolerate ACE inhibitors, we can go on to the angiotensin receptor blockers and there are trials with losartin, candesartin and velosartin. The first one is the losartin, elite, and this uh, has been given along with enalapril or without enalapril. And it has been shown that there has been no difference between the two in elite 1 and 2. Candesartin, it has been given in the resolved and the charm trial and they all have been shown to reduce mortality. Similarly, well, sartin has been shown to reduce congestive heart failure. Once we are given ACE inhibitor and angiotensin receptor blockers and we are quite happy with the patient, then what is the role of aldosterone antagonists? That is spironolactone and epirinone, which is available now in the form of aptus in the market. What do they have? These aldosterones have a further activity because both ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin tensin receptor blockers, they do not inhibit the aldosterone to the required level. And what, what is this aldosterone doing in the body? It is causing ventricular remodeling, five, myocardial fibrosis, as well as it activates the oxidized stress system and it also activates kappa B and subtle proteins which cause fibrosis. So in order to prevent that, we have to give aldosterones and they have been further apart from adding the two endotensin receptor blockers and to the ACE inhibitors, these aldosterones in the form of spirolactone or aptus, they have shown to reduce further mortality. We are to the last stage, a real stage of failure when the patient comes to you in the hospital. And what do we have to manage for that? One is the fluid management and the salt management. I will be showing you how the resistance develops to the diuretics which we have been using for these patients earlier. Then, neurohumoral inhibitors. When we give ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers, we do treat humoral inhibitors, but neural part is really not treated and you know that the atrial and the brain natriuretic peptides are increased which are diuretic as well as vasodilatory. So what can we do with the help of these treatments? Then many patients apart from giving digoxin, inotropic support is required to maintain their blood pressure. Dopamine, dobutamine are being used at the times. Amlinon, milrinone are also used. Then vasodilators. Vasodilators have a specific rule when the patient comes in acute left ventricular failure. Most of the times in the wards we give intravenous nitroglycerin. Sodium nitroprusside has a specific rule. Supposing if you have a patient of mitosis and you are doing a case and you develop at that time acute mitral regurgitation, sodium nitroprusside has a particular rule at that time. Then after having given all the pharmacological therapy, there are patients who do not improve. So what new is being added is mm, that we have to do device management and stem cell therapy plus the surgical strategies. Now looking at the diuretic resistance and the contributory factors are, you are already given to the patient furosemide. Supposing the furosemide is being given once a day. Some of these patients do not take it or take it on alternate days because they want to have, they have the inconvenience with nocturnal urea. Then they keep on taking unrestricted salt more than 3 grams and even the water. Yesterday we had a patient in the ward, a foreign MI, the patient had uh, primary angioplasty, ejection fraction was 30% and we asked him what happened, why are you so dizzy? He says I came back from my work and I took two jugs of water along with salt and uh, whatever I could add into that and I was so thirsty at that time and at night patient had gone into pulmonary. So this is the main rule of water and the salt. Supposing patient is very compliant, patient is taking the treatment, patient is following the salt and the water restriction as well but because of congestive heart failure there is a gut wall edema and the absorption is delayed or 
because of the reduced flow the absorption is less so for these cases what can we do we can give intravenous to these patients then ineffective diuretic prescription rebound phenomenon sometimes single dose gets rebound phenomenon and excessive diuresis then activates uh, renin angiotensin system then concomitant use of drugs like vasodilators endomethacin aspirin they are commonly being used in most of the patients sometimes aspirin is a drug which is used by all of us and it is being used in post mi patients after having taken the stent and all that but the point is that once this occurs we have to take into consideration all these drugs which are being used in the patient to find out the reason why the patient is having a drug resistance then lastly the renal pathology they can have prostate enlargement they can have obstructive uropathy renal artery stenosis cirrhosis nephrotic syndrome or a break phenomena how do we manage limit the water intake to 1 liter and sodium to about 3 grams per day use high doses of diuretics even up to 500 mg of furosemide has been used at times we replace furosemide by the oral torsemide because uh, torsemide is absorbed much better and has a better bioavailability as compared to furosemide then because of the gut edema and all when it cannot be absorbed then iv furosemide is given and continuous infusion is much better than all the time giving very high dosages because this avoids auto toxicity as well then concomitant use of uh, other drugs like uh, metalazone which is very very effective if you give this drug in the dose of 2.5 mg or even 5 mg once daily 30 minutes before furosemide these patients have lot more diuresis and they should be explained how to take the medicine many times i have seen that once this drug is added they become dehydrated i had to hospitalize a patient of 2.5 mg once daily to the hospital now the patient really knows and he uses the drug as and when required and he knows when to use it then spironolactone they should be used in combination to prevent potassium loss and we can enhance per renal perfusion by low doses of um, dopamine and dobutamine then ultra filtration and dialysis wherever they are required they are done selective inhibitors as i told you that hormonal inhibitors we have taken care with the ace inhibitors and endotensin but what about the neutral endopeptide diseases these drugs they inhibit renin angiotensin system and they potentiate natriuretic peptides they are all investigational at the moment but they are very good because they have specific effect they cause vasodilatation they reduce the systemic vascular resistance and the blood pressure and they also improve sodium water balance the drugs used are omapart trilate 10 to 80 mg daily given orally or candoxatril 200 to 400 mg daily and acadotrel these are the drugs which are under trial and then we have uh, calcium sensitizers what are they they have inotropic action that is they increase the contractility but how do they do they sensitize the calcium they do not increase the oxygen demand if the oxygen demand is increased then there is increase the uh, heart failure so without increasing the oxygen demand they act as inotropes and these drugs which are being tried intravenously are pimobidar and levosimedan then they are still under trial then cardiac natriuretic peptide which is available nesrititide this is a balanced arterial and venous vasodilator it causes marked natriuresis and diuresis 2 microgram is given as a bolus and then 0.1 per kg per minute is given as an infusion lastly we have vasopressin receptor blockers which are also under trial now once all the pharmacological therapy has been done then what happens to us still our patients are in failure they are repeatedly hospitalized and uh, they are not able to do their what to call their routine usual activities even less than that even day to day their own management they are not able to perform
So for that we have now the device management. And the device management, the first of all, you have all heard about biventricular pacing or cardiac resynchronization therapy. This is done for patients who have a low ejection fraction, that is less than 35%. Most of them, they have left bundle branch block with a broad QRS complex of 130 milliseconds or more. So, what is done here is that it is like a pacemaker which is under the skin and there are three leads, one is to the atrium, one is to the right ventricle and the third one is to the coronary sinus which will stimulate the left ventricle. All we want is that the atrioventricular synchrony, ventricle to ventricle synchrony and within the ventricle also that is intraventricular synchrony is maintained and this will further help us to have the improvement in cardiac output, systolic pressure, reduction in PCP, enhanced ejection fraction and reduction in myocardial oxygen inhibitors. But giving the therapy is in not very difficult, you just have to do like a pacemaker. But how to select these patients is the one which is important and these patients are subjected to a very detailed echocardiography and lot of modalities are being developed to recognize these cases. The first one is a M mode and the other are tissue Doppler and pulse Doppler. Thank you uh, ma'am. Actually in this uh, sessions uh, ma'am has discussed about the uh, types of heart failure, the definition of heart failure, the investigation and management component. Thank you very much.